2010. This is the Arts, Parks, Health and Aging Committee. We're joined by Mr. Reyes. We're expecting Mr. Wesson shortly. And uh, let's take these items up. Uh, Mr. <coughs> Item number one, please. Item number one, continued from June 22, 2010. Motion, we are raised relative to restoring funding for the licensed child care program in the amount of $6,078,588. This item has also been referred to the Budget and Finance Committee. Okay. Mr. Muckery, Ms. Adams. Mr. Reagan. We do have public comment cards, but let's hear from the Department and the report. Good morning, committee members. Regina Adams, Executive Officer of Recreation and Parks. We are once again before you regarding our licensed child care program that was recently eliminated in the current year's budget. Uh, what we have done at this point is there have been employees from Recreation and Parks who were tied to this program who were laid off effective July 1st, which is per the directions that were in the adopted budget for our department. There were several positions and classifications that were eliminated. And so we've tried to carry that out. Also for the summer program, what we've done uh, every year for the Department of Recreation and Parks, we go off the state license to offer summer camp programs for uh, children in the city of Los Angeles. And at this time, that is what we are currently doing. What the issue is for us is that as we move forward, after the summer, what are we going to be able to offer? We offer several programs for children, but the difference will be that for the fall that we will move into an after-school program, which we also already do. Um, however, this would be more of a recreational uh, programming versus the educational component that had been uh, tied to the licensed child care program. We have licensed, we previously had licensed child care program at 26 sites, uh, but we will not be able to continue that in the fall and thereafter. So what we're trying to figure out at this point is what we will be able to offer with the resources that we have remaining for the children um, for the age group, the school age group. The licensed child care program originally started back in the 80s and it grew out of with the LA Unified School District, which at that time was moving to a non-traditional track system. Um, they are now moved, have moved back to a traditional track system, and of course that changes uh, what we were doing. But also, they also for our child care program, we lost a, uh, state grant funding, and we've also had a reduction on, uh, in our enrollment. We are now uh, at we were at 59 percent capacity uh, for the children that were in our licensed child care program. Very good, Mr. Muckery. You have anything you want to add to that? No, we'll take uh, any comments and questions. Uh, basically, in the CAO's representative here on this issue at all? Or? Uh, Good morning. Ob obviously, we have a funding cycle problem in magnitude of greatness. Obviously, we have a transformation, though, in the uh, school district as, as opposed to returning many schools with the exception, I think, of schools in the uh, southeast Los Angeles County that are early unified that are still on multi-track and even my old high schools I think one of the last uh, John Marshall still on multi-track but the other schools that feed it are on regular track so that's a transformation what's the CAO's uh, opinion of this issue um, good morning Veronica Salumbidas with the office of the CAO um, with regards to the motion um, number 48 it's a budget motion that um, is asking to restore funding for the licensed child care program from savings from uh, the general fund commodities reduction as well as the personal services reduction. I just have a couple of comments. Those savings at this point have not been realized. Our office is currently working on a report back to council to determine um, those amounts. Um, at this point, we believe that those amounts are at the higher end of the spectrum and could significantly be lower. Um, at this point, we don't know until we complete our analysis. We are waiting for a couple of departments um, to respond back to our request for information. And do we know how many children are involved in these programs? There are about 900 children that were in the program. 900 children. And do we know, because uh, today is the 17th, 17th? Yeah. 13th, 13th, excuse me. Do we know what impact these last two weeks may have had on those 
individuals or what adjustments they made that they had to pay more seek other child care than what the city offered many of those children are in our summer camp program as i say that this is what we do every summer we change over to the summer camps and the parents enroll the kids in the summer camp programming at the rec centers yes not at the hollywood land or the girls camp boys camps camp i see are you talking about local camps at local rec centers correct thank you very we do have two public comment cards uh you want to ask questions now mr reyes it's up to you mr chair okay let's just the public comment cards right now we're joined by mr wesson thank you mr wesson lashan uh wiggers mark siegel mr mockery can we take your chair Hello, my name is LaShawn Wiggers. I'm a child care professional, also known as a child care director. I was recently laid off by the city. And the numbers that you were given were only the licensed portion. A lot of the programs had an unlicensed portion, like myself. I had 50 preschoolers in the unlicensed portion and 50 in the after school portion. So there were 100 kids coming through my program every day. So with these layoffs and these cuts, you have displaced not only the 50 children that you were reported, but you've displaced 100 children. And many of the programs, they do have more than 900 children in, in the, the programs. Yes, in the license program, the budgets did affect, did affect the numbers, but the parents were willing to pay. And I would like you to question why wasn't more things done to try to help um, the department when they knew it was going in this direction. Um, parents are willing to pay more and we're, we're wondering why wasn't that ever presented as an option. Um, we do provide a quality service that the parents have come accustomed to. The parents would like to work and this is a, an affordable option for parents every day to have their kids in a safe environment where they can be productive at work. So um, displacing over 70 employees, professional people who, who have a love for children. I've worked in your, in your region, Mr. Wesson, and also in Corette's region. Um, and I've seen the differences. So we would just like you to um, these cuts have dramatically Im impacted the lives of the families in all of your communities, so I hope you realize that. Thank you very much. Mr. Siegel? Thank you. Uh, my name is Mark Siegel. I work for AFSCME. But uh, 21 years ago, when I was just a cub, and Wendy Gruel was just a cub, we worked together to develop the first city child care policy. Um, and Councilwoman Pike has carried it through the council and we set up, the city had no program whatsoever for childcare at that time. And we eventually led to the building of the practice childcare center in City Hall South. And at that time, we were looking at the issues dealing with childcare and the big debate was whether it should be close to home or close to work. And it turned out that it needed to be both, close to home and close to work and that the city needed to have a whole array, diverse array of child care opportunities and choices for parents. This program is a very valuable resource for the community. And I think that um, it should be, you should not cast off these resources like LaShawn uh, to, to the four winds because she's got tremendous expertise. These directors and child care staff have tremendous expertise. They, because of the licensing requirement, they have to get, take class credits and, and graduate. Um, and it would be a wasted city resource to let these people go. Um, I think that summer may be a hiatus time where they do the recreational programs, but I would pull together a group of the directors and have them work with the department to, to refashion the program in the fall so that it can come back uh, at full strength. I think they need to explore 
sliding scale uh, fees, um, more effective marketing, and I, th I think that in no time you'll fill it up uh, if you're aggressive about doing the job. Thank you. Thank you very much. Is there any other public comment cards? I know some people came in late for item number one. And that being said, I'd like staff to return to the to the uh, table. Thank you both, Sean. Mark, thank you. I'm going to ask my colleague for comments. This is very difficult, John. I know for your department because of services that we have and and uh, the uh, absolute reduction in revenues that we have. The one point that I would like to ask is: Is anything any thinking can be done by your administrative staff to project into September, uh, October when school is back in session? What could be done, and also what kind of uh, cost recovery? Uh, could be made, and further, what kind of entrepreneurship could be made to those possibly who would be laid off but would be given permit to operate on one of your facilities as a child care facility? Uh, so that's one thought. Think about that. I'll call on Mr. Reyes right now. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And um, you know, this is a moment in which and I've been around councils and committees, and this is the moment where I'm supposed to get up, slam my this on the desk, I'm supposed to be yelling at you and saying, why did you ignore me? Back in May 17th, we did a motion, a motion that asked the very same questions that our employees are addressing today on why didn't we do this. That was May 17th. It turns out that your department did not even write a report and never got a number for processing within the committee. I never got to committee. So that's the first thing. Did not even get the courtesy from your department to even address the motion right off the bat. And that motion very clearly states, relative to developing a hybrid model for child care which includes retention of positions included for elimination, state license programming, additional financial commitment from parents, and a nonprofit service operator to address the cuts in the recreation and parks child care program report back to committee within 15 days. That was May 17th. Now granted, I understand everything we're going through. We're all going through this together. But I really believe this is a slap in the face. Not only to me personally, but to this council and how you just ignore, could just ignore a directive. It's just as important as any other one. And I know we do hundreds of them every week. So that's my deepest disappointment because I have had such a great relationship with your staff. Your staff has done tremendous work in my district. One of the districts of greatest need, there's four or five that are in that place where without your presence, their day would continue to be in a downward spiral if it were not for your staff and your hard work. But this is children. This, these are moms. My staff has been meeting with the parents. They've been pleading with us. Help us. We will pay. Give us some direction. Show us some leadership. They're telling me this. And I'll have to go back and say, well, they didn't even bother to pay attention. They didn't even bother to respond on this critical issue. That's the honest truth. That's what happened. Now we're in this place. Now it's July. And my question to you is really about, is there really the, the desire to make a difference? in this situation, especially for these mothers that are losing work. These are the kids who have nowhere to go. These are kids who are playing in stairwells. Their kids are stuck in their apartments. These are kids who don't even have air conditioning in their apartments. They have nowhere to get out. This is their only recourse. So I'd like to ask you, do we do not have this white paper? This, does this white paper exist? If it doesn't exist, I'd rather know now so that I don't have to depend on or think that something's going to happen because the collective intelligence and experience when your department just failed to do it. I'd rather you just come clean and tell me straight out, it doesn't exist. If it doesn't exist, fine. Then let's move on. What are we going to do? I have several questions regarding a possible direction, but I need to know if, because I was anticipating, based on our last conversation this committee, that there was going to be some level of analysis, 
some kind of projection of program elements, something that would be implemented. Something was going to happen with this white paper, and we never even saw the light of day in terms of what it was supposed to do. So can you at least give us that courtesy? First of all, Council Member, we apologize, but and I will take responsibility for that. We did not know about this motion. As a matter of fact, we met with your staff and we explained that to them. We did not know it. As a matter of fact, they provided us the motion and I contacted CLA's office and your staff to ask for a copy of the motion. We had not seen it, so we apologize for that. So we did not mean to slight you and that was not our intention. Also, I have been before the council several times discussing this item um, before the full council and trying to provide as much information as possible. As far as the white paper, we have not prepared a white paper. What we did provide uh, to this committee the last time we were before you on this item, we did provide a spreadsheet because we tried to take the information and put it in a format that we thought would be uh, more easily um, understood and read and and we also tried to lay out the differences between the type of child care programs that we do offer in the department. That is what we did present to you at the last um, committee meeting, um, but we did not get a chance to discuss it with you or the other committee members at that time. We did uh, also talk to your staff about that and state that this was a document we thought would answer a lot of the questions that you had presented in your motion, but we did not know about the motion uh, that was presented in May. But we thought that because we had been before the council um, several times on this item, we thought that we were addressing the various questions. And if I might also apologize to this committee and the council member in particular has been a great supporter of mine personally and professionally. We are going to work on all those issues. Understand in May, June, we were struggling to find a way to offset $38 million in cuts to the department. I'm operating at less than 77% of the budget this year than I had last year, and that's real dollars. Some of the things that are being done are indirects. So the cost of vacation, sick time, everything I have now have to borrow. So any program element we add, we have to have 100% full cost recovery. What I can do and what I will do, uh, even if I have to do this personally uh, in my spare hours, is I will prepare this white paper and analysis. I'll meet with your constituents. Well, we just recently took over the administration of the Joy Pikes Child Care Center. Uh, I have to be honest with you, those parents are paying upwards of $1,100 a month in that child care. Many of the uh, subsidized child, licensed child care we had, they were paying maybe $50 to $100 a month. So when we say that parents are willing to pay, I'm not sure they have the capacity to bear that huge increase which is being forced on all of us. Every general manager in the cities. Mr. Murphy, I understand that. So I, will, I promise you I will meet with you, your staff, and we'll get this going. We have some time. In the end of the day, it may be that this is too expensive for the city to afford. That may be the case. But in following up and how we can put together a support system, I have several questions for you. One is that what is the role of the Parks Foundation to raise private funds to help the child care centers, self-sufficient running centers with a licensed program? To me, there is a tool that we can look at. And the Parks Foundation, I want to understand what's the role in that element. And, and understanding, so that's, you don't need to answer that now, but these are the questions that would like for you to address. The other is, can each center become a standalone nonprofit to raise funds as they see fit? In other words, every child care center that has the capacity to build itself up, given the level of investment by each individual employee and parent, if they became um, that much more efficient in, in terms of dealing with their resources within their own regions, perhaps there are other opportunities that the local chambers, the local BIDs, the local companies, the corporations in the vicinity to help raise funds so that the centers can stay open, that the very same parents that need the centers to need to get to work, maybe their employees will see the wisdom in investing in these chapter centers as nonprofit entities. That's another possible structure that we should investigate. The other one is how much management and flexibility can the department afford each center. Then we have a 
fiduciary responsibility as a municipal corporation, we understand there's risk there. We understand we have parameters, we have reporting, we have the whole process of how you maintain and look at the flow of dollars, cash, back and forth. All of that, we've been through various scenarios with other programs where we have difficulties. But in this case, can we afford a certain level of flexibility while maintaining that integrity, while maintaining the type of mechanism that does uh, drill, drill down to the issue of accountability? To me, this will be a, a message to the parents that they matter. This is a message to the employees that they matter, that they have the capacity for greater involvement, that we're not treating them like children because we, we don't want to do it, you can't do it. I mean, this is the type of maturity we need to get through in this program and the type of priority that it needs. So I would like to see those questions addressed. Uh, I, I do not like disrespecting people, especially you, Mr. Merkley, knowing how hard you work in your department and all of your personnel, because I'm the many unsung heroes out there. Believe me, I have seen the positive, but in this case, in this one instant, I'm really, really disappointed, and it's heartbreaking to see how, how I'm watching the parents suffer and the children, and more importantly, when we could have prevented it. So I know we got caught in the quagmire of May and June. We were all in a big hole together, but I still need to address these parents, and I still need to address the needs of these children, because today is another day they're stuck in their apartment, they're stuck in that stairwell, and they have nowhere else to go. So that is what I would like to see as promptly as possible. So, uh, Mr. Reyes, what I'd like to do is chairs uh, continue this to the uh, first meeting in August. In the time, Mr. Muckley, as you said, your personal involvement in this and your staff, meeting with Mr. Reyes' staff and any of the staff on council to try to identify it. I was just thinking offhand, in my district, there's a number of locations historically. I know when the earthquake happened in 1971, what was it? Silver Lake was then moved to water and power property up on uh, Tesla Street. Uh, up at Las Palmas, there's one in the senior center. At the Shake Shack, which was where they used to sell popcorn when I was a kid, at the pool at Griffith Park, that's a child care center. Now, there's some kind of relationship you have with these organizations where they're not for profits that may be able to fill the void. So we'll look at that as well. And if I could, Mr. Reyes, for 30 days, or what's the next meeting? Say it again. August 10th. August 10th. August 10th. That, uh, that's a... Uh, Less than 30 days, but that would do. Is that all right with you, Mr. Wesson, Mr. Reyes? Okay, and, and we'll do that with item two as well. Will you call item two just because we're going to add those two together? Item two, Department of Recreation and Parks to report relative to the development of a hybrid model for child care, which includes retention of positions included for elimination, state license programming, additional financial commitment from parents, and a nonprofit service operator to address the cuts in the Recreation and Parks child care program. Thank you very much. So one and two are both going to be continued to the 10th of August. Uh, and as chair, I'm going to now call on items uh, 4, 5, and 6 together since Record Parks is here. We're going to hold the cultural affairs matter for a moment. We're holding number 3, but we got staff from Record Parks. This is very critical, members, that there's opportunities uh, from the side of all the state-funded programs to try to get them completed. I believe there's 49 programs. We're going to hear from staff so they gather around the table and what challenge that means to be able to complete these projects in the time allotted by the state. And then we, uh, I have some suggestions uh, as we go forward. Mr. Muckery, Mr. Scholl. Uh, I'm, I'm going to turn this over to Mike Scholl after one brief comment. The Department of Recreation and Parks views these funds that have been given us through grants as critical to the infrastructure, not only of this department, but these create jobs in the community. We buy goods and services in these projects in the community. So this is part of the economic development issue, especially in this time of crisis, the financial crisis. So as the general manager of recreation and parks, working with my staff, I just did not, I thought it was unconscionable that these projects could be in jeopardy because we could not meet the state mandated time frame for completion. So I challenged my staff both on the administration side with Susan Hundley and Grants administration and Mike Schull to come up with a plan where we would help the Bureau of Engineering complete these projects. And I just want to frame this in this discussion. If we're talking $60 million and we need to create jobs. So Mike, if you can just go over briefly what we're talking about. Thank you, John. Um, the um, 
I'll say a few comments, but I think it's important that our that Susan Huntley described the grants and, and discuss the, the issues at hand. But there there basically are deadlines coming up on Proposition 40 grants. There's a number of projects throughout every council district that are in jeopardy of losing those funds if we don't expedite these projects. Uh, one of the things under John's direction that we've done is basically taking our in-house construction staff under Rec and Parks. These are city, city staff. This is not contractors. We've almost um, diverted about 200 city staff uh, under Rec and Parks. Those are Rec and Parks staff to work on these construction projects. Um, that's something that we weren't planning on doing, um, but that's something that we must do. Um, so it, it, in a way, it's, it's, um, it's good in this times because we'll be able to offset some of those uh, general fund salaries with these special funds, but it also has an impact to our ability on some of our general maintenance that we would need to do um, at, at other parks. So we're, we're doing a balancing act with, you know, <coughs> sending these staff to these construction projects to meet these deadlines. but. There are other things and other projects that could be at risk. We've had to put Proposition 40 at the highest priority uh, for our department under, uh, you know, the construction projects. You know, recently have started a number of projects um, under Rec and Parks construction staff, Ascot Hills being one of the largest, um, and a number of others. But um, if I may ask Susan and um, maybe possibly the CAO to, uh, analysts here to, to speak a little bit more about the details of Proposition 40. Good morning, Susan Huntley with Recreation and Parks Grants Administration. Just to give some background on how we arrived at where we are, um, there are four um, Prop 40 programs that were scheduled to expire um, this past June as well as the June coming forward. Um, in uh, December of 2008 through May of 2009, the state funds that normally are provided to uh, cities on a reimbursement basis were frozen. And so we moved forward with a select number of projects that were currently in construction. Uh, the other projects that uh, were waiting to be um, moved forward were uh, basically put on hold. And what has happened is um, we've got about 49 projects that are still um, not completed. In response to the delay in the funds being distributed to the city, the uh, state parks has initiated legislation to extend projects that were going to expire this calendar year until June of next year. So we've got four Prop 40 programs that will be expiring uh, June of next year. And um, the issue that Mike described is that we're having some challenges in getting those projects completed by the deadline. Um, there are approximately four projects that due to um, uh, issues with um, the project itself, um, we're going to have some difficulties completing those by June. And staff is working with the mayor's office and uh, other council uh, persons to try and get an extension for those. But the dilemma we have right now is we've got about 49 projects that total about $60 million that if we do not complete them by the June deadline, um, we will have to reimburse the state for any funds that we've expended and any funds that would have come to us basically are forfeited. So we uh, uh, have been working with the Bureau of Engineering um, who manages most of these projects. Record Parks has taken on a portion of them. Some of them have been assigned to general services and the Bureau of Engineering will com uh, continue with some of those projects. So we have a challenge with trying to complete them in uh, the construction of the projects, which we're targeting for the end of December of this year or January. And then my staff, along with our accounting staff, needs to do the necessary accounting to actually close those out with the state by March. So we've got quite a large number of projects that have a very short deadline um, in terms of completing these activities by the state's due date. So, in the CAO? Yes. Anything to add? No, not to those comments. Very good. Members, so what we have here is an opportunity to build 49 projects. But we look around, and because of the severe budget cuts, the teams that we have to do them are not playing with the full amount of players. Now, that being said, we have to be extremely creative not to miss opportunity. $60 million of, of capital improvement is a tremendous asset to any region in our city. The one thing I did want to put on the table right now, and I know Mr. Wesson and Mr. Reyes, we all came from the same place as deputies to council members, and talking with Mr. Scholl on some aspects, 
I, we could maybe improve by getting all our park deputies or our building deputies or project deputies in a room to be able to knock down hurdles that they're going to get because there's nobody there. Because there's, there's, there's some gray male going for a project uh, in your district, Herb, that's sitting on somebody's desk and the person he ripped in April. And it's just sitting in somebody's inbox because there's still a great adjustment to this whole reconfiguration. I think that's a key way we could try to help. And when this comes to council, we want to let council really know how we got to watch these projects and how we got to be creative in working with the other departments. Mr. Reyes. Are we in a position to uh, understand every project has a performer, every project has a uh, history, a timeline? And I, I am aware of Mr. Scholl's talents. He's done some tremendous projects in my district. But I wanted to ask, um, there are different ways we can be supportive. I know sometimes political offices get in the way, but in this case, being supportive, what Councilman LeBond is stating is true. All of us have been staff. We've brought in departments to figure out what's going on. Some has to do with personalities. Some has to do with just the workload. People have different stacks of, of files on their desk, and maybe that project is in the middle of that pile. But are you in a position to let us know how we can help you get to these projects and identifying where they're stuck, or do you already know where the stalling factors are in, these, in each of these projects? I pretty much, uh, Mike Shaw with uh, Recreation and Parks, I, I do know, um, I, I'm pretty confident on every project knowing where it, it, where it is in the process. And that's where we kind of interjected ourselves into that process, um, Rec and Parks that is. I mean, traditionally we don't do a lot of, um, we've been doing more project delivery in our department using city staff. Um, the uh, But through through these times that we've gone through, these very tough times where other departments have been impacted severely and as well as we have and everybody has, um, we've had to look at things differently. We have to think of non-traditional ways of delivery of projects. So, I mean, one of the things, uh, and, and I, I think it is changing a, a little bit of the culture of how we've delivered projects in the past. We need to do it differently. Um, I do know that each of where we are on each of the projects with um, working with the CAO and Bureau of Engineering and, and Susan's group. Um, and we will need to call upon each of your staffs occasionally for assistance um, working with other departments because it's, it, it, it is cutting through. Timing is everything right now. And you know, so whereas, it, for example, it, where traditional building, like obtaining a permit, maybe through public works or through building and safety, we don't have the time. We don't want to circumvent the process, but we will need to expedite the process. Right. So you know, we will need assistance that way. So would you see our function being more of a uh, facilitating at the administrative level? The more administrative functions that need to move? Correct. Is that, is that where the major blockage is at? Well, I think in the I think what has happened is, is that over the last year and a half or so, I think you know there was a there was a time where the state stopped the funding, which was which created started the problem. Then it was exacerbated by the fact that we went through a challenging time with ERIPs and all this stuff. So, like as Councilman Lamont was stating, there was a lot of impacts to staff leaving and projects just basically slowing down where they shouldn't have slowed down. They needed to keep pace. We've committed through contracts with the state to for, to complete these projects. So it, it's been, it, it's a problem of the times. I mean, with the with the lack of staff. Now, I wish we would have been, you know, and but, and, but this, that does beg the question. Couldn't we we have uh, and very fortunate to have the former speaker of the assembly here uh, to ask to look at the mechanics of the state and see how we can get extensions. I mean, are, I mean in other words. We feel that sort of above our heads about to fall because of those we, deadlines. We, uh, can we expand it even more? Yes, and we, we have, and we have been working with the, the state, um, uh, uh, Susan stated, through the mayor's office to get extensions. But w one of the things that we've, t the approach that we've taken, council members, is we are asking, we will be asking for extensions, but we also want to take on the challenge of completing these projects just in case. I'm working under the worst situation. What, I'm working under the what if scenario if they don't extend. The worst case. The worst case. The worst case scenario. So right. that's where we're at as a department is working with the worst case scenario and pulling out all the stops 
to get these projects completed in case we don't get any further extensions. But there's one thing that's alarming, and this will be my last question here, is we understand the balancing act because there's only so much personnel we have, and there's personnel for maintenance, there's personnel for all different functions. Right. Now, we're shifting personnel for maintenance to do construction work. I imagine that can be done by normal so that you don't need that skill set. Is my assumption right? Let me explain a little bit of the dynamics of the department with construction and maintenance. And then I also want to add that we will, as part of the solution to this problem, we're asking, we will be going through the city's management hiring process to ask for a blanket unfreeze to allow us to bring on hiring hall employees, in which case they would come on and we would let them go after the project is done. But they would be funded through the project funds. So that's one of the things that we're looking at doing to offset what your concern is here. That's actually critical, and that needs to be very, we're working closely with the CAO and the mayor's office to expedite that through the process because we need that in order to not impact the maintenance side so much. Rec and Parks is mainly broken up. In our maintenance side, it's mainly the maintenance, the largest piece of our maintenance consists of like on the ground, the grounds keepers for the park system. It's picking up the trash, mowing the grass, trimming the trees, those sorts of things. We also have a facility maintenance side, which is responsible for the building upkeep, the general maintenance of building work. That's the main piece of the impact will be that facility maintenance piece, that staff. Those are the trades people. Those are the people that are the carpenters, the electricians, the HVAC guys, the sheet metal workers, those sorts of classifications. Those are the people that will be the biggest impact for the next six to nine months. Now, if I'm able to bring on hiring hall employees through this process, not paying, you know, coming right out of the project funds, and if I can get a blanket on freeze on that, that will help keep some of those facility maintenance people doing their facility maintenance jobs. Right. I appreciate that. And, again, it's can we get you to help move that in the planning department, building and safety? Those departments are responding to my planning committee. There's a way I can set up a special task force just to move your projects. That way they're all looked at at the same time for every district in the city. That would be a way to create a focus and a higher priority. Absolutely would be helpful for your committee to do that, and I'd be happy to come before your committee and discuss that, because most of the success that we've had in the past as a city in expediting things is setting up that very same task force. And, you know, some projects that come to mind that was in your district under Taylor Yard, that's exactly how we got projects like that done so quickly, is that we had a strong core group of people in the city that knew the importance of some of these projects, and you didn't have to go through the normal process of getting to the right people. So if you could help with that, that would be greatly appreciated. We should be in our office and put that together. We should put that task force together and create that laser beam focus and surgically move these things. Thank you. Just a question. Are these 49 projects past the planning stage, though? Yes. Some of them, a lot of them, we've moved them out of. They were still in design, and normally we would wait until they were, you know, 100 percent complete with design before we would start construction, because generally they go out to private contractors and you would need complete plans. But because we're utilizing city vendors and city staff, we may be building these projects with 20 percent plans. Right. But they still need building and safety. They need Bureau of Engineering. You need all the other departments that have very strong roles in how these projects move. So that would be the nature of that discussion. Absolutely. Mr. Wesson. Yeah. Could someone explain to me this extension process? Because I just can't, unless there's some, because of the language of these funds, I can't understand why we couldn't quickly have extensions granted. It's a legislative process. We've been working, we've done this one other time with a couple of projects under Proposition 12. And basically we got the necessary language to put through a legislative request, and it's approved through the state's budget process. So in working with the state on the extensions that we may need for the Prop 40 projects we're discussing today, we've been in contact with state parks, and they've advised that we need to start that process the beginning of the calendar year in terms of contacting the various legislators at the state level and to proceed with trying to get it approved as part of 
uh, next fiscal year's budget. And the extensions or the ones that you received in the past were one year extensions? Yes. It, it, and there must be language in the propositions that give you a timeline in which the projects need to be complete. Is that? There is a current uh, deadline, which is the one we were talking about now, which is June 30th of 2011. So if we were able to get an extension. Some of the projects that we're talking about that need an extension may need a year, but we have more than one project that need more than one uh, more than one year extension. So we need to work with the legislators in Sacramento as well as here locally to find out what the best way to approach that would be. Maybe a one year extension is not um, the most effective vehicle for those projects that need longer than a year to complete. Because I would think without a doubt if we can legally do this, which it appears that we, we already have, that we need to start looking at language that gives us more flexibility. And um, I would think that we could easily find enough votes, given the, the, the sign of the times, where we could, could pass this. But I, I, I would try to avoid handcuffing us with a, a tight timeline. And I would really like to be keep, kept apprised of this because I might be able to be of some assistance. And um, do, do they release the funds to us in a timely fashion? Almost all these are reimbursable. So we complete a portion of work, then we go through our grants administration, and we seek reimbursement. That's also one of the long poles in the tent on these expanding these funds. I've mentioned before it'd be nice if we could get a 10 or 20 percent upfront well, capital, so we can use that as a revolving fund on these. So if we are going in there to look at some legislative changes and language that will help all municipalities throughout this great state, but I'm more concerned with us. I'd like to see some of that upfront money be given to us so we can start these projects. Well, I would think that, that we could do that. You just have to add language again, re-guaranteeing that if we get this 20 percent up front and something goes sideways, we're still on the hook and have to repay That's it. Correct. But um, I think we may have a, a, an opportunity to shape this in a way where it really works for us. So what I would suggest, and you're already thinking about it, John, is when we go in there, let's have a comprehensive package so that we won't say, oh, doggone, we should have asked for some upfront cash and things of this nature. Let's try to get as much as we can within reason with one vote. So that's what I would su su suggest. If there's a legal, you know, with our lawyers, we can, I'm sure we can come up with a way to, to, uh, where that could work legally. When is it scheduled for council, Mr. Clerk? I say taken. When's it scheduled? Next Tuesday. Well, tentatively, we can have these on for July 20th if next the Tuesday. report's done today. Tuesday. Is that next Tuesday there, Mr. That'd Clerk? Be next Tuesday. Yeah, very good. What I would just ask, uh, Angela? Andrea with an A. I apologize, Andrea. Forgive me. If the CLA could uh, follow up on Mr. Wesson's uh, matters, and additionally, if uh, what Mr. Reyes spoke of and I spoke of on that in this report to council, that each council member identify a key staff person that would shepherd these projects through. There would be a contact that they would meet with. Rec Ration of parks, and I think sometimes it helps to meet collectively. Not only does it, when you have all the council deputies there, everybody sees their problems. Someone may say, "Well, why had that problem five years ago on something and we did this and that solved that?" There's a great uh, uh, knowledge, and then also, Michael, not in August but in September, if it's possible to you to come to this committee and give us an update on the 49 as we're making progress, Mr. Reyes. Yeah, let's just show what. what um this task force has certain characteristics that makes it work. And, um, and I just want to ask you the question, could you describe for us, not right now, but in that motion, uh, at least uh, 
key characteristics of this task force where we, each council office, office knows what kind of facilitation you need. Uh, every council has a different set of personnels and, and skill sets, but if you can tell us, okay, I need the person that can do this, this, and this, identify the departments that have to absolutely be part of the task force. So that way you're not creating more work for yourself with every entity, but you actually have almost like a border plate. I need these skill sets to move these uh, uh, projects and these departments. and which means the person can meet with Bureau of Engineering, uh, Power Water Power, I mean, it, uh, if we could just the makeup of, of what is it that you need so that way we know how to respond and we can move quicker. So create another layer of work for you. We know how to support you in this task force. There should be more work for you. We're trying to help you cut down work. Yeah. Is that something that you can... I can provide that today to okay, your good. staff. Right. And, uh, okay. Yeah, just one other thing. Now, I know that, 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 that my office works very closely with you, and I'm under the assumption that the projects in my district are, are moving along. Is that an accurate assumption on my part, or, or do I need to um, check with someone? The, the biggest, the, the, I, Susan can correct me, the, the biggest project in your district under Prop 40 um, that is of a little concern is the one related to the lighting around the tennis courts and the, that whole tennis court refurbishment. And one of the key items to the, and I'm, you couldn't have asked a better question actually because the key item as part of uh, our success of what I need is I, I lost a, the, under EREF, the electrical engineer who was doing that design. Oh. I'm asking, we're asking currently through the management hiring process to bring him back under a 90-day contract. It would be funded from the project. Um, so there's actually two 90-day contracts that we're asking for as well. He, he is actually working on the project even though he's not currently city employed. He's volunteering his time to keep that project moving. I mean, that's the kind of staff that we've lost and, and, um, so I, I'm confident we can complete that project, but it would be extremely helpful to be actually be paying him for the work that he's doing yeah. for us under the project funds. So um, the uh, his name actually the name of the uh, is Harry Sermani, and Harry actually designed Harry, the observatory. He did he did all the work at the observatory. Yeah. Designed the um, we're doing a um, he's do, he designed a solar uh, powered. Uh, Project that we're North Hollywood Park. At North Hollywood Park, where he designed a solar power project that we're doing. We're going to dedicate this Wednesday in CD14 in Pecan Park. That'll be the first park almost taken off the grid because of solar power. He is a huge loss. So, Councilman, that 90, support on that 90 day contract would be extremely beneficial. Well, you can consider that, that done, and we would pay uh, his contract. Uh, uh, from the construction cost of the actual project. And there, yes, we can. And there's a, the other 90 day that, that we're asking for is an accountant to help us that will also be helped expedite some of these projects through the, through a 90 day process as well. And if we were able to make that occur, then we think, because I, I, you know, John, I stay on my park oh, projects. That's my love. So if, if we are, approve these two contracts, 90 day contracts, then the, the projects in my district stay online. I'm pretty confident they will, yes. Okay. Hi, Ms. Brimsley, our city attorney. Uh, yes, Council, uh, Councilman Labonge. Just wanted to caution you. I think you had requested that Rec and Parks um, meet with all of the council deputies to discuss these issues regarding the projects. Um, just want to be mindful that you don't want to run afoul of the Brown Act. How long has the Brown Act been around? So, why don't you just post a meeting? Yeah, just yeah, post a meeting in here. Just post the post meeting. meeting. I mean, it's not like and Michael, you sit right here and have water power here, building and safety here, engineering there, whatever. You'd be the chair and have everybody out there and have it a meeting. As long as you comply yeah. with the requirements of the Brown Act. Okay. We don't want, like Ed said, we don't want to give you work. We want to give you opportunity. So that would be good. How, what's the statute of limitations on the Brown Act? Statute of limitations on the Brown Act because back in last century I used to do that around here. We'd have meetings with the, so all I, the deputies. I, I'm, I'm, so it, it, all we're asking for a working group to take care of projects. But I understand that, that, but you want to make sure that if you if, if you establish a quorum of the council, that's a legislative act. So you need to make sure you have an open uh, meeting deputies, and it's properly yeah. noticed because I, the, your deputies are extension of you. Okay. Well, no, I understand that. Just okay. <laughs> so let me just say this. I just could never wrap 
my head around that idea because they weren't elected officials or what have you. But when I was at the county of Los Angeles, we almost got sued because we had a weekly health deputy meeting where every the five supervisors had a health deputy there. They have been posting those meetings now for years. I don't even know how many years. Maybe, God, ten years. And I can't remember how it all happened, but that's how. I mean, it's a pain, and you know where the pain is, but but it, you, you have to do what you have to well, do. Well, your deputies are your intermediaries. So as I said before, they're extensions of you. It would be as if they were action, acting in your state. Well, see, if Nate Holden was here, he would tell you we're elected, they're selected. It's a yeah. big difference. All right, well, let's hear it for Nate Holden. But Ms. Brimley, thank you for the advice. <laughs> so with that being said, we have everything that we have to go forward, including the request for the uh, uh, hiring, managed hiring. Uh, hiring hall in uh, right. 90 days, yes. Good, yes. Regarding item five on the agenda, I uh, passed out to the clerk um, three additional allocations that we'd like added to that report, right. as well as one correction. Uh, on page two, there's um, $39,951 going from San Pedro Welcome Park. It says Averill. It should say Leland Park. Okay. So you'll correct it before it gets to council? Uh, yes. yes. Additionally, it appears that there's a difference in the 40 RZH discretionary funds on this amendment that was passed in versus what is listed on the report. So for the record, please clarify what exactly, because um, in your report on uh, recommendation number two, you speak of $3,660,810,000. Are we now switching that to $225,000, or is this in addition to that? I'm sorry, I'm not following uh, okay. If you look at the June 24th report from the LA Kids Steering Committee here, under the recommendations, um, number two, under Prop 40, Robert Zeberg Harris discretionary funds, and I'm looking at this amendment that you gave me for speaking of the same thing. Does, does the amount now changed or what? I'll, I'll come over and explain okay. it. We'll need to clarify that for the record. All right, will you be able to have that handled by council? Yes. Or do we need to change uh, it now? Um, Yes, the faster we can. We can provide a clean copy of the attachment um, for purposes of council. Thank you. So we go forth with this matter. We all understand our mission and our role and our guidance from Ms. Frimsley, our city attorney. We thank you for that. And uh, Mr. Wesson, your other important fact, which just makes life easier. So, uh, so order on all three. And we'll see them in council next week. Next item, please. Item number three, Department of Cultural Affairs report relative to recommended reconfiguration expenditure plan of the DCA special appropriations accounts. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Um, my name is Olga Garay. I'm the general manager of the Department of Cultural Affairs. So, um, there was a motion that was made, motion, council motion number 40, asking um, the department to respond to their recommend to our recommendation of uh, reconfiguring our expenditure plan. And the memo that we submitted to you all explains um, our rationale for doing so. Essentially, um, our department is issuing almost 500 contracts a year. Um, Probably over half of them are for grants that the program makes through an established peer review process that brings in hundreds of professional artists and arts administrators to um, review proposals that are uh, sent into the department and then award or make uh, recommendations based on the merit of the particular proposals. Because those proposals go through a rigorous peer review process and because those um, grant awards are able to be itemized in the annual budget book, um, those, um, a, a bulk of those do not have to go through the Executive Directive 3 review, which is a rather uh, laborious um, additional step. Um, However, up to now, a large chunk of our grants, um, and they're basically in the festivals category and uh, other sorts of special events, even though they go through peer review as well, um, 
and they're listed in the budget book have been going through ED3 review, and it has really um, been a, a tremendous amount of um, extra work, not only for our department, but for the CAO's office and the controller and all of the, uh, and the, all of the other um, departments that are responsible for reviewing uh, contracts. So basically what we're going to do with this report is uh, send it forth to council. If we have any questions, we want to make sure council sees it. They should contact you if they have any concerns with the amounts that are given. But the amounts are given based on what, what why does someone get 5000 why does someone get 16000 Well, like I said, these are all peer-reviewed, and we have um, stated criteria that are, um, you know, told in the guidelines. Right. And so these these peer review panels, which are professional, and this is the way the National Endowment for the Arts does I it, I got it. Et I just want to make sure you get that question from council. Right. And then is it reviewed that the money is spent purposely for that? How do they know? Absolutely. We have final uh, reports that are due. Uh -huh. Our staff routinely goes to some of these events to see that they're carried out and correctly. And 100% of these people fill out the final staff review on it? Correct. Okay. Good. Uh, we do have one public comment card. Ms. Watkins? Please come to the center table. Um, the budget that's listed today and being reviewed, I guess, and it's going to continue to be reviewed, the, I, I'm assuming or thought that the line item budget for the Watch Towers Festival, um, has, it's been reduced. Um, since March 24th, when I came before you, the neighborhood is in crisis in regards to the Watch Towers and what's being planned for it. We have yet to get staff uh, confirmed, program funding, operations, security's been cut back. I've got weeds next to my house that are eight feet tall, thanks to CRA. And now our budget for the 35th annual Jazz and Drum Festival has been cut by almost $20,000. From what to what? Uh, I believe from 70,500 to um, 5322. Okay. Um, and I understand you're in crisis, but it appears to me and it appears to the community that there is no comprehensive uh, uh, work being done to take a look at how this particular location is going to be transitioned and cared for. So we're continuing to take hits and this, the decisions made by DCA, they say they don't have time, they're, they're busy, but they're going to Madrid, Guadalajara, Ireland, all kind of places to do work internationally while their art and culture heritage is being slaughtered. It's being slaughtered. And under your tenure, it's very important for you to just take a moment in time throughout the summer and the fall to take a look at how this is being done. So it's done in a way where it's not lost forever. Because decisions are being made exclusive of community experience. We have over 200 years of investment from nonprofits that have been in the Watts community that are willing to step forward to work with the city to make this happen and that's being dismissed. And so we have a festival, it's 35 years old, it's going to happen in September, and we have yet to get to the planning because this budget is still sitting. Understood that. Uh, Mr. Can I respond? Oh uh, Yeah, sure. Um, I just wanted to say that the festival is funded at $70,000. It's just that $19,000 is in our regular um, uh, 1070 account, which is for part-time workers, and so the 53000 is a grant that is going to be made to the Friends of the Watts Towers, as has been in the past, but an additional 19000 some odd dollars has been allocated for the um, Watts Towers director to be able to hire people to man the Assistant. festival. And Ms. Hahn is involved with that? I know she's very passionate yes. about this. But, okay. but but the the essence is is that the festival will still be budgeted seventy thousand dollars. It's just that it's in two different categories. Right. Yeah. And I, I just wanted, just for the record, uh, when flights are taken to Guadalajara or to Dublin, uh, they're usually funded by other entities, not out of the city's expense. But more importantly, the revenues that come back to the city as a result of those efforts is a big support to the artists, 
to much of the talent here in, in Los Angeles specifically. So I just want to just, for the record, lay that out because the illusion was that we're, at least my impression was that we're taking international flights and forgetting about our home. And in fact, these flights are about our home and how we make it better. So I just want to put that for the record. Thank you. Mr. Wesson? Yeah. Uh, Olga. Um, and I forgot your last name. My last name? Yes. Does it matter? <laughs> no, I just wanted to address you by your name. Janine is my name. Okay. Janine just came up and said that, you know, $20,000 approximately was taken away from the festival. Mm -hmm. Now, you then countered, indicating that, no, it hasn't been. It's just coming uh, from two different pots of money. Yes, sir. Janine, you didn't know that, or did you? That's the problem. And so this is where I'm trying to go, and I don't want to get in the back and forth, because I hate when, and you and I have been at a meeting, and I, I just, it kills me when people get up and they say something, and, and in her mind, she's right. So that it needs to be communicated. So a lot of the other concerns, I'm sure Janine is legitimate with as well, but there needs to be better communication so that she know. I don't know if the director should indicate that the budget hasn't been reduced, but uh, it, we need to, especially during these difficult financial times, try to communicate better. That's the point I just want to make. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, with that being said, we thank you for your public comment. This report will go forth to City Council. And uh, make sure, Madam C.L.A., that each council member gets a listing of this so they know going straight forward. And uh, how much reduction has been since last year's budget? I'm sorry? How much reduction? For much? the Watchtower specific? No, no, no. All of them. All of them listed. You, do you have Our budget? Our budget has been... No, no, no. The grants that you've given out. Oh, oh, oh. You have a list. Have you seen the list of all the monies that Right, right, right. Out? No, what we tried to do was try to protect the grants because we think that... I got that it. Is so this is the same money that we gave last year. Correct. Got it. Thank you. Is there any other public comment? No other public none of, comment? None of the artists from Watts have gone to Debl Dublin. So some of the artists are being, being assisted. Other artists are being excluded historically. So I do need to make that comment. Very good. If you want to wait a minute here, I'll talk to you uh, after the meeting to try to assist in any way possible. Uh, no other comments. This meeting is now adjourned. Thank you very much.